Harriet Tubman, Chapter 21, With the Union Army. After the death of John Brown, Harriet began to feel dissatisfied with the life she was leading. It seemed to her that she was doing absolutely nothing for the cause of freedom. Certainly the audiences before whom she spoke offered no challenge to her ingenuity or her imagination. She traveled on trains unhampered, unhindered, stayed in boarding houses, or visited the homes of her friends openly, freely. When she thought of the restrictions imposed on the slave population, she longed to return to Maryland to bring out more slaves. She was still surprised by the enthusiastic reception she was accorded. When she finished talking, people began to clap, and then they stood and cheered and came up onto the platform to shake hands with her, to give her money. Many of them told her not to make any more trips into the South for fear she would be caught. This was a thought that she had she impatiently rejected. As of no consequence, she was more interested in how the whole question of slavery should be would be settled. She was certain that it would be settled soon, one way or the other. Southerners believed that the entire North had supported John Brown, and in 1860 they lived in dread because they thought that a tremendous uprising of the slaves might still occur. Northerners, as far as she could tell from what she saw and heard in her travels, had turned the fugitive slave law into a joke. People said that in northern Ohio, where Levi Coffin operated the busiest branch of the Underground Railroad, it was impossible to put an abolitionist in jail and keep him there, no matter how guilty he might be of harboring runaways. It was almost impossible to try a runaway slave. She found that out herself because she became involved in the case of a runaway slave who had been arrested and was to be tried. On April 27, 1860, she was in Troy, New York. She had spent the night there and was going on to Boston to attend an anti-slavery meeting. That morning, she was on her way to the railroad station. She walked along the street slowly. She never bothered to find out when a train was due. She simply sat in the station and waited until a train came, which was going in the direction she desired. It was cold in Troy, even though it was the spring this year, the spring of the year. A northeast wind kept blowing the ruffle of her bonnet away from her face. She thought of Maryland and how green the trees would be. Here they were only lightly touched with green, not yet in full leaf. Suddenly she longed for a sight of the eastern shore, with its coves and creeks, thought of the years that had elapsed since she first ran away from there. She stopped walking to watch a crowd of people in front of the courthouse, a pushing, shoving, shouting crowd. She wondered what had happened, a fight, an accident. She went nearer, listened to the loud, excited voices. He got away. He didn't. They've got him handcuffed. Then there was an eruptive movement, people pushing forward, other people pushing back. Harriet started working her way through the crowd, elbowing a man, nudging a woman. Now and then she asked a question. She learned that a runaway slave named Charles Null had been arrested and was being taken inside the courthouse to be tried. When she finally got close enough to see the runaway's face, a handsome, frightened face, his guards had forced him up to the courthouse steps. They were trying to get through the door, but people blocked the way. She knew a kind of fury against the system, against the man who would force this man back into the slavery when they, when they themselves were free. The Lord did not intend that people should be slaves, she thought. Then, without even thinking, she went up to the steps and forced her way through the crowd until she stood next to Null. There was a small boy standing near her, mouth open, eyes wide with curiosity. She grabbed him by the collar and whispered to him fiercely, You go out in the street and holler, Fire! Fire! As loud as you can! The crowd kept increasing and she gave a nod of satisfaction. That little boy must have got out there in the street and must still be hollering that there's a fire. She bent over, making her shoulders droop, bending her back in the posture of an old woman. She pulled her sunbonnet way down so that it shadowed her face. Just in time, too, one of, the police woman's, one of the policemen said, Old woman, you'll have to get out of here. You're liable to go get knocked down when they take him through the door. Harriet moved away from Null, mumbling to herself. She heard church bells ringing somewhere in the distance, and more and more people came running. The entire street was blocked. She edged back toward Null. Suddenly she shouted, don't let them take him. Don't let them take him. She attacked the nearest policeman so suddenly that she knocked him down. She wanted to laugh at the look of surprise on his face when he realized that the mumbling old woman who had stood so close to him had suddenly turned into a creature of vigor and violence. Grabbing Nall by the arm, she pulled him along with her, forcing her way down the steps, ignoring the blows she received, not feeling them not really feeling them, taking pleasure in the fact that in all these months of inactivity she had n lost none of her strength. When they reached the streets, they were both knocked down.
Harriet snatched off her bonnet and tied it to Nell's head. When they stood up, it was impossible to pick him out of the crowd. People in the street cleared a path for them, helped hold back the police. As they turned off the main street, they met a man driving a horse and wagon. He reined in the horse. What goes on here? He asked. Harriet, out of breath, out of breath, hastily explained the situation. The man got out of the wagon. Here, he said, use my horse and wagon. I don't care if I ever get it back just so that man gets to safety. Null was rapidly driven to Schenectady, and from there he went on to the west and safety. Harriet's friends knew that she was in danger of arrest for the part she played in Null's rescue. They saw to it that she stayed hidden in the house on the outskirts of Troy for two days. Shortly after, afterwards, she went to Boston, where she filled two speaking engagements, one at a meeting of the New England Anti-Slavery Society on May 27th, the other at a women's suffrage meeting on the 1st of June. After this, she returned to Auburn, where she spent the summer. She was restless, impatient. People were talking about Abe Lincoln. He had won the Republican nomination for presidency in the spring. No one thought he had a chance of winning the election. Even if he did, Harriet doubted that he would do anything about slavery. In November 1860, she made another trip to Tidewater, Maryland. Perhaps she felt the need for action. Perhaps she wanted to return to the fields and the woods and streams of the eastern shore in order to offset the tame cat life she had been leading on lecture platforms. Possibly the rescue of Charles Null had whetted her appetite for adventure. Perhaps the memory of John Brown haunted her too. In any event, she brought out a man and his wife with three children, one of them six years old, one of them four years old, and a three-month-old baby, and another man. En route to Thomas Garrett's in Wilmington, they met a young woman who was also escaping and joined the party. On December 1st, Thomas Garrett wrote one of his characteristic letters to William Still in Philadelphia. I write to let thee know that Harriet Tubman is again in these parts. She arrived last evening from one of her trips to mercy, of mercy to God's poor, bringing two men with her as far as Newcastle. I agreed to pay a man last evening to pilot them on their way to Chester County. The wife of one of the men, with two or three children, was left some thirty miles below, and I gave Harriet ten dollars to hire a man with carriage to take them to Chester County. She said a man had offered for that sum to bring them on. I shall be very uneasy about them till I hear they are safe. There is now much more risk on the road till they arrive here than there has been for several months past, as we find that some poor, worthless wretches are constantly on the lookout on two roads, that they cannot well avoid more especially with carriage, yet, as it is Harriet, who seems to have had a special angel to guard her on her journey of mercy, I have hope. Thy friend, Thomas Garrett. Despite Garrett's uneasiness, the entire party arrived safely in Philadelphia. William still wrote their names down on loose slips of paper. His big notebook had been hidden for the capture of John Brown's papers and letters, with names and plans in full admonished us that such papers and correspondence as had been preserved concerning the Underground Railroad might perchance be captured by a pro-slavery mob. Still wrote swiftly and briefly, Arrival from Dorchester County, 1860, and under it Harriet Tubman's last trip to Maryland. Then he put down the names of the people who came with her, and that was all. When Harriet when Harriet returned from this trip, her friends in Auburn hurried her off to Canada, suddenly afraid for her safety. It was not until she reached Canada she heard. She learned that old Abe Lincoln, who had won the election in November. In December, South Carolina seceded from the Union. As the year turned, the cotton states began leaving the Union. Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, Texas. In January 1861, she was back in Boston. She was there when John A. Andrew was inaugurated governor of Massachusetts. He was a short, heavy-set man who wore spectacles. Men said he was a free soiler and a radical. The day he was inaugurated, he sent out a call for the Massachusetts militia and sent a man to England to see about guns. He talked about the need for money for overcoats for the militia. That winter on Boston Common, Harriet heard the word overcoat become a joke, a slang word for warmonger. In February, the states that had seceded formed a new union called the Confederate States of America. Jefferson Davis was elected president of the Confederacy. On April 14th, the Confederacy took over Fort Sumter. Lincoln set out a call for militia. 
Governor John A. Andrew of Massachusetts tele telegraphed the president, the quota of troops required of Massachusetts is ready. How will you have them proceed? The answer was, send them by rail. No other state in the Union was prepared to act so quickly. In a week's time, Massachusetts was able to send out infantry, riflemen, and artillery, properly equipped and thoroughly drilled. It was John Andrew, the dimple, curly-headed governor of Massachusetts, who was responsible for Harriet Tubman's finer major, final major role. During the Civil War, she became a scout, a spy, a nurse for the Union forces. In May 1862, she boarded the Atlantic, a government transport headed for Beaufort, which is located on Port Royal, one of the Sea Islands, off the coast of South Carolina. She was sent there at the recommendation of Governor Andrew. The Confederate forts had been taken on November 7, 1861, and Port Royal and St. Helena were being used by the Union Army, Army as supply stations. Slaves had been flocking to these islands ever since the Union forces had set up headquarters there. These slaves were referred to as contrabands, the term originated from an army report of May 24, 1861. Three fugitives were brought into Fortress Monroe by the Union Picket Guard. The Confederates asked for their rendition under the terms of the Fugitive Slave Law, but they were informed by General Butler that under the peculiar circumstances he considered the fugitives contraband of war. Port Royal was filled with contrabands, poverty-stricken, sick, homeless, starving. Many of them had traveled miles from the interior of South Carolina in order to reach the Union headquarters on the island. Some of them had been wounded by plantation owners who had attempted to halt their fl flight. A hospital had been set up for them on Port Royal. It was in this contraband hospital that Harriet Tubman began to play her new role of nurse. She said, I'd go to the hospital, I would, early every morning. I'd get a big chunk of ice, I would, and put it in a basin and fill it with water. Then I'd take a sponge and begin. First man I'd come to, I'd thrash away the flies, and they'd rise, they would, like bees around a hive. Then I'd begin to bathe the wounds, and by the time I bathed off three or four, the fire and heat would have melted the ice <clears throat> and made the water warm. It would be as red as clear blood. Then I'd go and get more ice, I would, and by the time I got to the next ones, the flies would be around the first ones, black and thick as ever. More deadly than the wounds was the dysentery. Each morning when she went back to the hospital, she found more and more people had died from it. She was certain she would check it if she would find the same roots and herbs there on the island that had grown in Maryland. But this was a strange new country to her. Even the plant life was different. One night she went into a wooded area near the water and searched until she found the great white flower, flowers of the water lily floating on the surface, reached down and pulled up the roots, hunted until she found Crane's bill, then she went back to the small house where she lived and boiled the roots and herbs, making a strange dark-looking concoction. It was a bitter-tasting brew, but it worked. The next morning she gave it to a man who was dying, who was obviously dying, and slowly he got better. Once again men called her Moses, saying that no one could die if Moses was at the bedside. She soon learned, however, that the contrabands resented her being able to draw rations, as though she were an officer or a soldier. They saw no reason why she should be as, so especially privileged, so she stopped drawing rations. In order, to earn, in order to earn money to buy food with, she made pies at night and home-brewed root beer, which she got one of the contrabands to peddle in the nearby army camps during the day. In January 1863, shortly after Lincoln had proclaim, proclaimed the slaves free, she saw a regiment of Negro soldiers for the first time. Thomas Wentworth Higginson, their commanding officer, was an old friend of Harriet's. As Harriet watched these men parade through the sandy streets, shaded by the tremendous live oaks, 1,000 ex-slaves marching in unison, she was overcome by emotion. The band of the 8th Maine met the regiment at the entrance to Beaufort and escorted them all the way. She thought this, she thought this the most moving sight she had ever beheld a regiment of black, newly freed South Carolinians wearing the uniform of the Union forces, escorted by the band of a white regiment. She knew how Sergeant Prince Rivers, the six-foot color sergeant of the 1st Carolina Volunteers, felt when he said, And when that band wheel in before us and march on, my God, I quit this world altogether. That night, long, before, long after she'd gone to bed, she could hear a kind of rhythmic hum from the direction of the camp sound of singing, 
the clapping of hands, the throbbing of drums, a kind of carryover of the day's excitement. About a month later, she started serving as a scout for Colonel James Montgomery, who had encamped at Port Royal with the first detachment of the Second South Carolina Volunteers, also composed of ex-slaves. On the night of June 2, 1863, Harriet accompanied Montgomery and his men in a raid up of the Combahee River. They had two objectives, to destroy or take up the torpedoes that the enemy had placed in the Combahee and to bring back to Port Royal as many contrabands as they could entice away from the river area. They soon found out that they would not have to entice the inhab inhabitants away. As the gunboats went farther and farther up the Combahee, they began to see slaves working in the rice fields. At first, the slaves ran away toward the wood. Then the word was passed around, Lincoln's gunboats done come to set us free. People started coming toward the boats, coming down the paths, through the meadows. For one on each side of them, of the river, there were rice fields and slaves working in them. They kept coming, with bundles on their heads, children riding on their mother's shoulders, all of them ragged, dirty, the children naked. Harriet said she had never seen anything like it before. Here you'd see a woman with a pail on her head, rice a-smoking in it, just as she'd taken it from the fire, one young hanging on behind, one hand round her forehead to hold it, the other hand digging into, into the rice pot, eating with all its might. Hold of her dress, two or three more, down her back, a bag with a pig in it. One woman brought two pigs, a white one and a black one. We took them all on board, named the white one Be Beauregard, and the black pig Jeff Davis. Sometimes the woman would come with twins hanging around their necks. Appears like, appears like I'd never seen so many twins in my life. Bags on their shoulders, baskets on their heads, and young woman, young ones tagging behind, all loaded. Pig squealing, chicken screaming, young ones squalling. They were taken off the shore in rowboats. All the contrabands tried to get in the same boats at once. Even after the boats were crowded, they clung to the sides of them, holding them fast to the shore. The men rowing the boats struck at their hands with the oars, but they would not let go. They were afraid they, were afraid they would be left behind. Finally, Montgomery shouted from the deck of one of the gunboats, Moses, you'll have to give him a song. Harriet sang, Of all the whole creation in the east or in the west, the glorious Yankee nation is the greatest and the best. Come along, come along. Don't be alarmed. Uncle Sam is rich enough to give you all a farm. At the as each verse ended, the contrabands threw up their hands and shouted, Glory, glory, glory. Immediately the small boats pulled off, hurriedly unloading their passengers on the decks of the gunboats. They came back and got more. After the small boats were filled, Harriet had to sing again and again until they got all 750 contrabands on board. Shortly afterward, Harriet had someone write a letter to Franklin B. Sanborn in Boston, asking for a bloomer dress because long skirts were a handicap on an expedition. Sanborn was at that time editor of the Boston Commonwealth. He had made a front page story of the Com Combahee Raid and Harriet's part in it. It appeared Friday, July 10, 1863. Colonel Montgomery and his gallant band of 300 black soldiers, under the guidance of a black woman, dashed into the enemy's country, struck a bond, struck a bond an effective blow, and brought off near 800 slaves. Since the rebellion, she, Harriet, has devoted herself to great, her great work of delivering the bondmen with an energy and sat, sat, sagacity that cannot be exceeded. Many and many times she has penetrated the enemy's lines and discovered their situation and condition and escaped without injury, but not without extreme hazard. During the winter of 1859-60, to 60, when Abraham Lincoln was campaigning for the Republicans in the New, York, New England states, he spoke of the reason for the difference in the point of view of the South and the North. In Hartford, Connecticut, he said, One-sixth of the population of the United States are slaves, looked upon as property, as nothing but property. The cash value of these slaves, as a moderate es estimate, is $2 billion. This amount of property value has a vast influence on the minds of its owners, very naturally. The same amount of property would have an equal influence upon us if owned in the North. Human nature is the same. People at the South are the same as those at the North, barring the difference in circumstances. <clears throat> and that's the end of chapter 21.